put that, we'll go straight. To yes, this meeting is being recorded. <laughs> so just letting you all know uh, that this meeting is being recorded. So we're gonna talk about our agenda. Let's go back to our agenda real quick. Um, and so, yeah, there we go. Um, so we'll, we're doing a welcome introductions and agenda. We'll have some etiquette, some workshop etiquette, and then we'll move into the presentation um, from who will be presented by uh, Carl's, uh, Carl Mill um, and I, I, Asha Wilkerson. So uh, they're going to be going through a number of different things. I'm, I'm going to give them a little bit more of a, uh, some background in a second. Um, and then after that, we're going to go into our announcements and closing remarks. So I want to shoot it over to Davina for our workshop etiquette. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Davina Gibson. Um, I am the operations lead here at Oak Fur. Um, I'm just going to briefly go over some workshop etiquette um, here um, so that we ensure that this workshop goes smoothly. Um, we kindly ask that you mute your microphone uh, when you are not speaking to keep background noise at a minimum and so we can focus on our presenters today. And um, as for the camera, if you do decide to be on camera, um, we just ask that you are in a well-lit area with the camera at eye level so we can see your lovely faces. And um, if you have questions or need tech help, uh, you can reach out to me, Davina, or Simone in the chat room, in the chat box, I'm sorry. All right, and that's it. Thank you, Davina. Um, Thank you. Also, as a reminder, we do have a, a, a survey uh, that we always encourage folks to, to complete. It get, uh, provides us with feedback for our, um, for our workshop series. So, Again, encouraging everyone to complete that survey. We're going to pop it in the chat in a second because um, I, I think I just went ahead a little bit because Davina was going to talk about it. Uh, um, but um, we'll pop it in the chat. Uh, encouraging folks to fill that out um, before they hop off the call. Um, if you have questions, um, you can you can always shoot um, me, Davina, um, Charla, or Ebony uh, um, a chat message. Um, we're going to be monitoring the chat pretty frequently throughout this workshop series. Okay, all right. So with that, I'm going to transition it over to our presenters and give them the best introduction I can do at 9.09 .09 in the morning. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I'd like to welcome um, Carl Mill, uh, Asha Wilkerson, um, who are phenomenal individuals. Uh, Carl uh, has his um, own practice called the, the Mill uh, Center of Law, for law. Hope that's right. Um, just started. Um, has been so the number of years working in um, nonprofit law space, supporting different nonprofits and organizations uh, with navigating through um, through some 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 tricky situations, um, and also supporting them and continuing on to create impact. Um, Aisha Wilkerson um, is a professor um, at. Um, um, I'm gonna make sure I get everything right because I'm not on the right screen. <laughs> um, is a professor uh, and, and department chair of the legal studies uh, program at the American River College in Sacramento. Uh, she has worked a number of years working with a number of people of color throughout the community with consulting, with leadership development, um, with navigating through employment uh, law, um, HR law, um, and uh, is a phenomenal individual um, who is down to support the community. So we are blessed and really fortunate to have them um, presenting this morning. And I want, want to make sure you all give them a warm welcome um, as they are going to present some very interesting materials to you today. So I want to hand it over uh, to, to them um, and they will take it away. All right. I can get us started. Everyone can see that okay, I hope. So yeah, we're covering key principles of nonprofit law. Um, I wanna, like I said, like, like Sean says, me and Asha, you're gonna hear from me first, but luckily I'll be handing over to Asha pretty soon. Um, here's what our goals are. Uh, we're gonna be thinking about this sort of short-term and long-term planning for your nonprofit. So when I'm thinking nonprofits, I'm mostly gonna be focusing this talk on, you know, 501c3 charities, either, they may be organized as religious corporations, they may be organized as public benefit corporations, maybe they're churches, 
Uh, all those are the, the, the kind of things we're going to focus on, and, and we're breaking this to talk in the short term and long term. You know, I'm going to handle the short term part because that's the kind of person I am. Uh, what do you need to know right now? And if, if you're thinking about starting a new nonprofit, what are the things you need to think about first? And uh, then and that will help with more of the long term stuff. You think you'll hear from both of us throughout. Uh, it's kind of a cliche, but I really do want this to be a conversation. So, you know, feel free to ask all the questions, raise your hand in the chat, put in the message. I'd really love to be happy to be interrupted anytime to talk about this stuff. Um, also, just in general, you'll see that there's a lot of material on the PowerPoint. I don't think either Asha or I expect to cover all of it. A lot of this is here just sort of as a resource for you to come back to. So, so we'll highlight the stuff we think is most important. You can ask about the stuff you think is important or your own questions, and uh, and, and there'll be plenty more to, to talk about later. Um, so with that, let's get started. Short-term tasks. So like I said, this is sort of a label decide what should have happened and what to double check. So maybe you're, you're at the beginning and you're asking, well, what do I need to do to set up my nonprofit? Or you've been around for a while, but it's been a while since anyone's checked whether it was done correctly. So we're going to kind of go back and start from square one. You know, the first thing that happens as a nonprofit uh, in, in California or pretty much anywhere else is you have articles of incorporation. Um, th those articles are going to say a few things that are important to know about the organization. So, well, I mean, the articles of word corporation tells you what the name of your organization is. You would be surprised that some organizations aren't aware of their actual legal name. They're using a different one. There's room to use DBAs, but you do want to consult with your articles of corporation for what your legal name is. Uh, more importantly, uh, your articles of incorporation also define what your purposes are. Uh, so this is actually an important strategic point when you're setting up a new organization. A lot of new organizations go in with the idea, well, I know what exactly what I'm going to do. So I'm going to write that the purposes of this nonprofit are to do X, Y, and Z activities at this address on these days of the week. And I'm going to be really narrow and specific about what my mission and purpose is. You know, that all sounds great. It's just when we, what we'll talk about later is the purposes in your articles really matter quite a bit. Because when people give you money, uh, it can only be used for what, what those purposes say. So very common situation is people set up an organization a long time ago it starts as one thing over the years it becomes a different thing and you might want to revisit this uh, provision so you can make sure you do you can do all the things you want to do that's one important things in your articles the articles will also cover what happens when you dissolve it will cover uh, who can amend the articles uh, usually if there's someone who, who has the power to consent to amendments but all that's all the sort of typical stuff the more detailed document are your bylaws. So your articles get filed with the Secretary of State. Your bylaws don't get filed with anyone. Uh, but they do need to be approved at the time you set up. Um, they'll go through the key you know, procedures in terms of how you're supposed to run the organization. So the most important thing that your bylaws will say is, well, you know, who are your directors and how are they appointed? Um, most nonprofits have what are called self-electing boards or self-perpetuating boards probably the boards you're all used to right directors elect the you know elect, the directors elect the directors so when there's a vacancy on your board the board gets together and votes uh who the, who's going to fill that vacancy that's pretty common but it's not the only way to do it there's a couple other ways that you might maybe you have with your organizations or you might want to consider for a new organization um one is called a designator organization so when i'm setting up something when I'm setting up a nonprofit for someone who is approaching it sort of like an entrepreneur does, where this is my thing, you know, uh, I'm setting it up now. Nobody owns a nonprofit. Uh, it, is, it sort of exists for the benefit of the public, but I want to make sure that this thing doesn't get away from me. So I always want to appoint the board. You can have an individual or a company or another nonprofit be the designator and they appoint your board. If you're going to have that structure, that's in your bylaws. Um, what officer positions do you have? You know, president, secretary, treasurer, chair, president, secretary, treasurer. Uh, who appoints those officers? Do they have to be on the board? Do they not have to be on the board? Um, and I'm just going to apologize in advance for any fire trucks that go down my street because apparently I live by a fire station now. Um, so yeah, you want to know who your directors are, who your officers are, how they're elected, how often they're elected, what are your terms? These are the sort of things your bylaws will say. Uh, how often you'll have meetings, who can amend the bylaws, all that kind of stuff. Um, fiscal year, signing authority, 
the, you know, make sure you're aware of the copy of the bylaws, that you haven't looked at them in a while, make sure all the board has a copy, that they're familiar with what they say, and that you're holding meetings the way they need to be held. You know, the nice thing about nonprofit corporate law is that, you know, most problems are fixable. You know, every once in a while I run into a situation where things get really tricky, but even, you know, nonprofits inherently are, you know, mostly volunteer run organizations, or at least the board is an all volunteer organization. It's not uncommon for things to get a bit out of whack, but a good place to start is go back to your articles, go back to your bylaws. What do they say? And are we doing it? If not, do we need to fix ourselves or do we need to fix our bylaws? Uh, either, either one of those is usually an option. Um, you, if you have already created your nonprofit, there should be initial corporate actions. So that's usually something called an action of sole incorporator. Basically, whoever signs the articles is the person that's going to appoint, adopt the bylaws, appoint the directors, appoint the officers. You should have that in your record. So all the people you think are directors, you know why they're directors. It's this piece of paper, right? You want to be able to go back to that. Um, and then sort of first meeting minutes, uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll get a little more into minutes in a second, but certainly at the beginning, there's a lot of things that need to be decided on who's going to have, be able to sign contracts for this organization, who's going to sign checks, uh, who's going to, uh, where's the bank account going to be set up, but those sort of things, there, there's usually gonna be some kind of corporate action at the beginning that's going to spell out a lot of that stuff. Uh, the last thing, you know, the last step when I'm setting up a new nonprofit and the, and the last thing that I would be, you know, sort of your first step in checking in on your organization would be the conflict of interest policy. Um, having one is easy, following one is harder. Um, having one is the first step. So having a conflict of interest policy, the IRS has a foreign policy that when you applied for tax exemption, if you apply for tax exemption, uh, it would, you would normally be uh, they have a sample policy you can use. It's not the best policy, but it's better than nothing. So if you have that one, that's a good start. Um, the basic point of a conflict of interest policy is to make sure that you follow two sets of rules. There's federal tax rules around transactions with insiders, and there's state corporate rules around transactions with insiders. So you want a policy that kind of walks through the procedures for doing both. Um, now, so substantively, like I said, having a conflict of interest policy is easy. 95% uh, of the, the clients I meet would have them. Uh, I would probably say less than 50% follow them, and that's probably being a little generous. And so in terms of what it means to follow your conflict of interest policy, I would sort of start, think about it from sort of approaching your organization like an audit checklist. Uh, do we have any transactions with insiders? Uh, so if you have a paid employee, I'd say you probably do, because if you pay your CEO, that's a transaction with an insider, right? That, you're, you know, that person has significant power at the organization. And what are we doing when we review their comp? Are they in the room? Or are they not in the room? Do we, do we, do we have disinterested people voting on it? Are the people on the board, that person and their family member? Like, or what are we doing to sort of make sure we build out um, a, a set of po policies and procedures that make sure we are uh, acting only for our charitable purposes and that the public the attorney general, our donors, the government do not don't look at us as something to benefit a particular person. Uh, one thing, just as a the spirit of all this stuff, when it comes to nonprofit law, and one of the things I deal with a lot is often I'm dealing with people who have their their business and then they have a nonprofit and and they expect to kind of run the nonprofit like they run a business. And in some ways, like running a nonprofit is like running a business, but the key difference is that, like I said, nobody owns a nonprofit, so. You know, if you have an LLC or you have a, your, your, your own C corporation, um, you might kind of feel like when I deal with that company, I'm dealing with like it's money out of one pocket and into the other pocket. And in some ways, it's, that can be true. Uh, with a nonprofit, it's really somebody else's pocket. You know, you're the, a nonprofit, you might be the person that runs the nonprofit, but there's, it's, it's effectively the public's money. And so you have to sort of, uh, conflict of interest policies are important because they, help you make sure that when you're dealing with somebody else's pocket, you're dealing with it appropriately. Um, so that's sort of the initial slate of corporate documents that you're going to expect. Let's talk about sort of in the short term, what do you need to know just to kind of be a, be an effective nonprofit and, and keep in, keep in mind with nonprofit law and just generally best practices. Um, I mentioned that a lot of board directors are volunteers. It's also true that directors are fiduciary. So, you know, these are organizations that are run by volunteers, but it's a volunteer position that comes with a, a heavy burden in some ways. It is you, you are responsible for making sure, so exercising your duty of care. That's, 
uh, managing the organization like an ordinarily prudent, reasonable person would, uh, and the, the duty of loyalty, which is making sure that you act only in the nonprofit's best interests. Now, you can satisfy those duties by relying on people, by relying on experts, by relying on lawyers, by relying on accountants, by relying on your officers, as long as it's all reasonable reliance, but they are serious. And when things go wrong, the people who are personally liable uh, are the directors potentially. If, if the attorney general comes in and thinks, you know, you've, this is the public's money and you've caused harm by acting irrationally or operating this nonprofit to enrich yourself, uh, that those are the people they look to. So it's important, you know, exercising, you know, the first, the first rule is, you know, do your best to exercise your fiduciary duties. And when you do, make sure you're documenting what you're doing. Like when you, when you enter into a decision and it turns out to be bad years later on, and you know, you want to know why you did it at the time, because you know, it's it's not a breach of your fiduciary duty to be wrong. It's a breach of your fiduciary duty to be unreasonable. So like if you if you you know if things turn out poorly, that doesn't mean you're liable. But I would I, when things turn out poorly, I really love it when people went back and document. Here's all the good reasons we did this. Uh, we weren't we weren't trying to act recklessly. Um, I'll, I'll kind of cover a few more things here. I don't want to get too bogged down in this. Board meetings, make sure you're having them, make sure you're documenting them. Um, in terms of what you cover, you know, the board should be the big picture uh, leader of the organization with your officers handling, officers and staff handling things on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, big decisions should come up to the board. The board should review the budget. The board should review whether that budget was followed. If there's variances from the budget, the board should generally be approving those. Big contracts. Contracts, the board should be approving big expenditures. Um, those are, you know, you, you want to make sure your board is, is fully informed and on top of that. Um, if someone, if you have boards where you have a lot of disinterested, disengaged people, you want to try to work towards building an engaged, active board because, like I said, these are actually pretty significant duties, even if sometimes, you know, uh, there's lots of directors out there that don't quite approach it that way. Uh, corporate records, make sure you have a minute book of some kind. Um, you know, it could just be a PDF file on your computer that has your determination letter, your filings, your big contracts, your minutes, government correspondence. Whenever there is an AG audit, but if I AG, AG and attorney general, we'll get to them in a second. You know, they always ask for, you know, provide all of these things, all those things I listed. And it's really good to get off to a good start with a regulator when you can actually just show them all those things and not say, hey, I need, I've been in a situation where it's like, hey, actually we need a few months to kind of get those things together because we haven't been on top of that. Uh, that's usually not the best way to start. Uh, financial statements and controls, you know, um, make sure that you, that, you know, not one person controls everything in terms of the finances, make sure everything's visible to multiple people. Get dual signature requirements you know work if there's a budget work with an accountant eventually if you get large enough you may have to work with an auditor uh those those concepts will sort of follow good financial management and the last point uh, is director and officer insurance in general nonprofit director and officer insurance is a lot cheaper than for-profit director and officer insurance there's good reason to to get it uh cal nonprofits uh has an insurance uh, program or a nonprofit that does insurance for other nonprofits, I generally recommend getting it because, uh, like I said, there's potential for personal liability, and you know, a, a good shield to have at the end of the day is some insurance where if everything goes wrong, you're you're protected. Um, and I'll, I'll pause there for a second. Um, yeah. So, if there are any questions so far, let me know. Uh, otherwise, I can kind of jump into this next chart here. Can you? It, sorry, go ahead. Can you repeat what you said about? the uh, insurance yeah absolutely so directors and officers insurance is what i would generally recommend that nonprofits get so directors and officers insurance basically says you know if there's a situation uh where they will cover directors and officers for personal liability if there's a situation where they would have held a person liable it'll also help cover litigation expenses if directors are sued in their capacity as directors uh good thing to get early um, because again, it's relatively inexpensive and you're grateful to have it if something bad comes up, that there'll be someone to pay for legal expenses and to, and to potentially offset some of the liability. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then I'll jump in, into this next part unless anyone has any questions. Um, so I have a oh, yeah, question. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, executive compensation. Um, yeah. You know, I'm 
concerned about some in the city uh, that the people are making hundreds of thousands of dollars and this is government um, funded f for poverty programs and the programs are struggling for you know paying their workers uh, less than uh, living wages and uh, so could you discuss the uh, you know challenges to uh, access how we can challenge excessive uh, executive compensation yeah no that's a such a great question and thank you yeah, there are, um, so there, there are certainly lots of nonprofits that pay people lots of money, right? Uh, I mean, setting aside the, the sort of the operating charities, think hospitals, universities, uh, football coaches, the numbers can get quite large, um, but there's, these rules apply to everyone. And so the way, uh, let me think about it, so I'll, from, this, from the perspective of if I were a director or I were a member of the public, what rules I would point to as sort of a pressure point on executive comp. So one, you'd start with, well, is that person who's getting all this compensation also a director? Uh, if they are, there's clear corporate procedures that need to be followed. Um, they can really only be paid that if it's sort of the best deal available for the nonprofit. And the directors could be yelled for, you know, uh, personally liable for overpaying someone. That's one thing to raise. Another thing to raise is that California has this thing called the Nonprofit Integrity Act. And that requires the board, every time there's a change in compensation or approval of compensation, to um, determine, you know, review the compensation, determine that it's just fair and reasonable. Uh, th these are all, of course, very vague terms, uh, <laughs> Denise. And I think one of the, the, the catches is, is that, you know, with the, the, the process for reviewing uh, compensation is usually, you know, Oh, let me give you one more rule that you could point to, and then I'll then I'll get into my spiel about, you know, uh, how it, how it tends to work out in practice. Uh, then the last, there is a rule um, for organization that file 990. So it's really most organization other than churches. There's a whole section on, on sort of insider compensation, and it falls under this rule called the excess benefit transaction rule. And that rule says that any compensation that's paid to an insider, and you know, your CEO, your executives are going to be insiders any amount that's in excess of what is fair market value compensation is uh, taxable. To, there's a, actually a tax penalty to that individual on it. And so there are procedures to follow. And basically what those procedures for all this stuff boil down to are, you know, review salary surveys to compare yourself with similar organizations and, you know, is what you're paying within the, the average range of what other people are paying. Um, usually there's going to be a 25th percentile, there'll be a 75th percentile. You can get this from GuideStar, Geisler has these surveys. Um, there's other, you know, all the sort of public information that 90s available. If you're doing it more informally, you could say, okay, well, what are, what are five or six similar nonprofits to us? What are they paying their CEO? What are they paying their executive director? Um, that doesn't get to the pro the underlying problem you might find, which is that, you know, those, those, you know, salaries can support sometimes significant salaries, sometimes not. It depends on the size of the organization. But what I would do is just point out there are pressure points. This, these, these organizations don't exist for the benefit of executive directors. They exist for the benefit of the charitable purposes. And if you have, you know, if, you ha if you're paying high compensation, the, the board should be able to articulate why it's high. You know, well, yeah, we're paying this person $200,000 a year, but they've proven that they bring in a, an extra $5 million a year in fundraising. Okay, well, that's more convincing than a $200,000 a year salary with an organization with a $500,000 budget, right? Now now 40% of the money is going to a particular person. So there are IRS rules that can make that problematic. There are uh, you know, state rules that can make that problematic. The attorney general, attorney general uh, looks at insider compensation and it gets complaints that looks into it. But in terms of from a protecting yourself as an organization standpoint, make sure that when you have, if you have higher numbers, you're prepared to defend them and explain why this is in our best interests. Um, I, hope, I hope that answers the question a bit. It's a topic we could go on for a while about. But do you know of cases um, where this has been challenged successfully? And could you suggest, you know, somewhere we could do some research? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, there are definitely, off the top of my head, I can't think of a specific example, but there are definitely organizations that have been hit with tax penalties for, you know, excessive compensation. Uh, the attorney, and where I would go in terms of looking for research on the attorney general website, California attorney general. Um, one, they have a sort of a complaint uh, protocol there, but they also sort of have a record of how they've addressed these things when they have investigated. So in terms of specific examples, I can't usually, 
usually when action's taken, it's when everything's gone wrong, but there's definitely cases of nonprofits being revoked uh, based on excess compensation. Uh, and one last part I wanted to ask you about comparing to other ones. I mean, this is commonly done that that these, you know, in, in this area that I've checked so far, that uh, people are paying themselves, you know, to over 200, 300,000, stuff like that. So to say it's commonly done, but that does, that means it's commonly done that the people are being ripped off. How can, you know, yeah. what's the standard upon which you, you decide what's fair and reasonable, you know? You understand? No, it's a good, yeah, no, that's, that, that is kind of what I was thinking, alluding to is, I, I do think when you look at the true surveys for, for similar organizations, it, it mm -hmm. won't support those kind of numbers for small work for small organizations, for medium-sized organizations, for organizations that are operating charities, the average numbers aren't that high. You might be able to find those outliers, but you generally should be looking at sort of a full, you know, um, full range. And you, if you look at those surveys, I think you'll find much lower numbers in terms of the acceptable ranges. So that that is one way to, to put some downward pressure on comp. And, and the other way is really just to sort of talk from a board perspective, you know, you need to be able to look at all alternatives and is 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 this really what this person is is worth on the market? I mean, the, the flip side of, of, of your argument is like, you know, people in nonprofits will say, well, look, this is, you know, this is what I'm able to make here and I could bring all this value and I'd bring at least that much value to the organization so they should pay it. But I also hear the side of it of that does cut into cut into program. I, I do think the AG is 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 a is a regulator, and this is actually a good transition to this slide. Is a regulator that thinks a lot about this because um, you know they're charged with making sure that charitable funds aren't being diverted to to benefit individuals. Okay, um, thank you so much. Oh yeah, you're welcome. And so I said we kind of already started down this road, but let me talk about who your who your regulators are, with the goal being to make sure that in the short term, at least, you're sort of keeping up on your annual filings and you know who's watching over your shoulder. Because like I said, this this is with nonprofit money, it's no longer just yours anymore. Um, there's the IRS, they're involved because you know you have tax exempt status uh, and therefore they get to decide the rules for who gets to be tax exempt. There's the California Franchise Tax Board, same principle, but at a state level, that's the state version of the IRS. Yeah, you, you're not paying California taxes. And so if they don't like what you're doing, they get to have a say. In, in some ways in recent years, I've seen the California Franchise Tax Board be actually more active than the IRS and, and the nonprofit area, in, at least in some sectors. Uh, there's a California Secretary of State. Uh, admittedly, they don't do much, but that is where you filed your articles of incorporation. They do have a filing we'll talk about. Uh, the California Attorney General, like I said, they're in charge of regulating charitable funds. Um, and here, you see, I made this little spectrum. On the left are things that are kinds of organizations that are least regulated. And on the right are organizations that are most regulated. I'm mostly focusing on the two in green, uh, maybe the operating public charities for some organizations that they don't have a religious connection. Um, the, so we know that churches are the least re regulated and I, maybe this will be kind of become clear on the next slide, but I'll just give you a basic, uh, basic uh, overview. You know, churches under the first amendment don't have to do a lot of the things that other people have to do. So churches don't file 990s, for example. 990s are the charity annual tax return that everyone can search on GuideStar and learn about your organization. Um, you can try to learn about churches on GuideStar and you'll have a hard time because there's no information on there. Uh, so they have the least, they have the least transparency. Uh, you know, they do, they do still need to follow the rules, but it's not as publicly available what they're doing. Likewise, they don't actually even have to apply for tax exemption. Um, the next box over is other faith-based organizations. So if you're not a church, and then for this purpose, church really means, um, I was going to say steeple, but you don't need a steeple, but you do need to be a place where people get together and have services, operate like a church, have a certain set of beliefs. But that's what a church is. Other religious organizations, look, we're, we're spiritually informed, we're faith informed, but we do, we mostly do this other stuff that's not a real worship service or anything similar. You know, they are generally going to be treated like any other public charity uh, for tax purposes. They do, if you're a religious corporation, you do get some benefits in terms of less regulation from the AG, but generally all the same rules apply. And everybody else is just sort of in the same bucket as a 501c3 charity. There are certain rules for private foundations we won't, I won't bore you with today, but I think we're all talking about operating uh, charities. And so let me kind of walk through, I'm going to walk through these pretty quickly because uh, I want to let Asha jump in and give you guys more time for questions. But I do want to, um, 
make sure I you at least know that these slides are here because this is all these next four slides are really just about filings. Um, filings for nonprofits don't need to be a big deal, but once you start missing them, it becomes a big deal. So it's important to know what they are so you don't fall too far behind because it's a much easier to file than it is to fix being suspended or revoked for not having filed. And, and it's like, is now a good time to pause for a question? I think someone might have had a question before I, before I bore you guys with filing instructions. Hi, Carlos Ebony. We have Hi, a Ebony. question in the audience. Is there a limit from, from board members on personal donation to the nonprofit? No, that's a good question. No limit on donations. Um, one good rule of thumb is money going into the nonprofit uh, good, money coming out of the nonprofit to directors bad, right? So like if the money's coming in, it's very like, unlikely we're gonna have a problem. If, if you ever became an organization that was almost exclusively funded by a small number of people, it's possible you could become a private foundation. There's a public support test, all that stuff. Um, you know, that would come up when you file your 990. And in fact, this is one of the things we'll talk about now. Uh, that's the only real downside, but that would really require someone becoming the primary funder over a five-year period. So basically, no. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let me, let me talk about the IRS for a second. So like I said, if you're a church, you really don't have to worry about the IRS that much. The only time you have to worry about the IRS is if you generate UBIT. Uh, I might talk about UBIT later. Uh, just know that there's some circumstances where nonprofits pay tax on unrelated businesses. Uh, so if your church owns uh, a car wash and makes a lot of money from the car wash, you still have to pay taxes just because, uh, even though you're a church, because you're just running a business. Uh, there's lots of exceptions. We won't get into those. That's really your only touch with the IRS if you're a church. Um, everybody else, though, uh, needs to file a tax exemption application, usually within your first 27 months. If you've been around for it, you've probably already done that. Uh, you have to file a Form 990 each year. It might just be a simple postcard if you're small called the 990N, but you got to do it. And you have to, like I, like I mentioned, Ebony, you have to pass a public support test to remain a public charity. For, for operating charities, it's usually very easy. The, the kinds of organizations that don't pass the public support test are think family foundations, think company foundations, think organizations where all the money is coming from a person, a company, a family. If you're generally trying to fundraise and you know, you're not relying on one person, uh, you're generally going to pass that support test. But it can come up if you're ever going to have some big grant that might change the, the funding of your organization. And just like churches, if you have UBIT, you got to pay it and file a form to pay it. Um, so, And this, like, this applies to all of those i'm going to pivot over to the franchise tax board so uh, you know so all right we've already ticked off one annual filing we know we need to file 990s with the irs each year when you file that 990 with the irs you're also going to file a 199 with the california franchise tax board if you're working with an accountant they should know to do that too uh, again churches don't need to file annual returns but they do unlike they do have to establish state exemptions so just because you're a church you have to have at least that initial contact with the FDB saying, hey, we're a church. Once they say, yes, you are a church, you say, great, we'll never talk to you again. We don't file the 99s, uh, but uh, you need to at least do that first step. Um, so you'll file the 999 each year, you'll file the 199 each year. Just like with IRS, there's a short form called the 199N, uh, which makes it pretty easy if you're a smaller organization. The numbers, I believe, 50,000 or under, but I can never really remember, but it's around that number and you'll check when you get around to filing. The IRS actually has pretty clear instructions on this for the 990, same with California Franchise Tax Board. So there are two annual filings you need to keep track of, 990, 190N. The other is the California Secretary of State. So if you exist as a corporation, that means you've already filed your articles of incorporation. So you did the first step. You got to, after you do that, you need to file an initial statement of information within 90 days. You can do it online. It's very easy, but it'll basically say, the, here's our address. Here's who our officers are. Um, here's, if you, someone's going to sue us, here's where you send the lawsuit. That's the agent for service of process. Um, but that's, you know, you need to do that within 90 days. Uh, once after that, you owe the statement of information every other year. And I think this is the one I see organizations miss the most. And honestly, I think it's because of the every other year requirement. Nobody thinks in terms of every other year. Uh, you should get a postcard from the Secretary of State saying, hey, don't forget to do this. Um, 
This is the one where if you don't do it, you can get suspended by the Secretary of State, which will then tell the Franchise Tax Board, hey, you should suspend them too. And they will tell the AG, hey, you should revoke them too. And now you have a whole mess to clean up. So really important to make sure you filed your statements of information. So let's say you incorporated in June 2016. That would tell me that every other year at the end of June, you need to, fi you need to have filed this. So June 2018. June 2020, June 2022. If you go to the Secretary of Web State's website and go to business search, you can look up your organization. You should be able to see all the statements of information you filed. If, if you get to that website and it says suspended uh, or it says you haven't filed, that's a sign. You got may have a little bit of cleanup to do. The sooner you do the cleanup, the less cleanup it is. So good thing to be thoughtful about. And I got one more of these and then I'll pause for questions. Uh, the AG. So um, the Attorney General regulates charitable funds here in California. They basically stand in for the public when it comes to charitable funds. Now, when it comes to or corporations organized as religious corporations, they have a lot less oversight. So when you go to your articles of incorporation, one thing you're going to see is, does it say I'm a nonprofit religious corporation or does it say I'm a nonprofit public benefit corporation? If it says I'm a religious corporation, I have a lot less to worry about because I don't have to do these the initial filing with the AG, I don't have to do an annual filing with the AG. Uh, if it says I'm a public benefit, then I do, even if I do a lot of religious stuff, even if I'm very religious, if I'm a public benefit, I need to be registered with the Attorney General. So that's a good first thing to check. Uh, if you're subject to it, you have an initial registration within 30 days of getting assets. I would just sort of do that after you form. Uh, you have to file every year you know the, this is pretty easy to do because it'll be your 990 your 199 those are your tax forms and then your accountant will typically prepare your rrf1 and then and you that'll be your um your 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 filings for the year and the attorney general has very, very broad authority um and just for a, a time perspective i'm going to skip ahead because i feel like i haven't got i'm not i'm cutting in dosh's time too much uh i was going to talk about fiscal sponsorship if you want to talk about fiscal sponsorship you can ask some questions later. We can talk about it. I will say the, the, the pro of fiscal sponsorship is not having to deal with all the things I just listed because someone else is dealing with it for you. The con of fiscal sponsorship is you give up some, some degree of, not some degree, you give up legal control. Uh, you're really relying on the trust relationship. So I can talk about the pros and cons if that's something that interests you. Silly charts that I made. And I'm going to pivot over to long-term planning where you can talk to Asha. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, okay, so I just want to plant a seed in your head right now, something for you to think about. I feel like a lot of smaller nonprofits, the, the story is always the same about struggling for money, applying for grants, and figuring out how to get that next donation, right? But have you thought about creating an endowment? We know that universities and colleges have endowments. Um, some of the bigger nonprofits have endowments, but have you thought about it for your nonprofit here in the Bay Area? So Carl, can you hit the next slide for me? Thank you. Um, and the next one after that, because I just did that part. <laughs> okay, so an endowment really is like, it's like an investment account. You know, if you think about your retirement account where you're putting money away in your 401k, your 403b, and it's gonna sit there over time. And then at some point, you reach the age where you can start withdrawing money from the principal balance, right? Your money is the interest is accruing on the principal that you invested, and then you're pulling money down. That's the same idea for an endowment and how that works. So you want to take a principal amount of money, put it into an endowment, which is an investment account. The idea is that the principal will um, accrue interest, and then the nonprofit can draw down the interest from that account and use that to operate or to pay salaries or to, uh, I don't know, fund a scholarship or something like that. So that's, that's one idea that I want you to consider um, for how to plan your long-term financial strategy because recurring revenue is definitely, it's a problem for all businesses, but probably even more so for nonprofits just by the very nature of you're not um, making money like regular, but like for-profit businesses, right? You're relying on those investments from folks. So think about that. Some of the cons though of uh, having an endowment, can you do the next slide please? There's, there's a few cons on, as you already know, when you're receiving money, there's restrictions oftentimes on the money that's donated. Um, I'm sure you probably are grateful for all the money, but when you see this check can only be used for this account on Wednesday of every odd year, 
you know, between the hours of two and four, right? I'm being, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you know that that's how that can be. So you want to try and get some money that is unrestricted to be able to invest in this endowment, or maybe you want to have a couple fundraisers to fund an endowment. Another thing to consider, one of the pushbacks is, is this the best use of funds? If we can get together, I'm just going to use $100,000, nice round number, $100,000 and put it into an investment account, would it be better used to serve the community? So sometimes you'll have that discussion with your board of directors to see what is the best use. It is a long-term strategy. So yes, $100,000 would be great for operating expenses right now, but what can $100,000 do for you over time? Uh, also, the amount of principal required to be able to draw a sufficient amount of interest is probably going to be pretty high. So what's the threshold number that your organization needs to get to in terms of its investment to make it worth it? And then um, another thing to consider is the community image. We already had a question earlier about these directors making, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and the nonprofit is struggling. You have to, you do have to consider what does it look like to the community to have a nonprofit that may have an operating budget of like $45,000 a year, but there's $100,000 sitting in the bank accruing interest. Now, again, that's not a reason not to do it, but you would want to think through all of those things so that you can narrate your own story and explain to investors and the folks that you're serving what the plan is long term so that you can control that image um, that that is being presented to the public another thing i didn't put on here but i just thought of it um, now is that sometimes if you have an endowment or organizations that have an endowment um, because the principal is usually is restricted from being drawn upon because you want it to accrue Oftentimes, that will keep the nonprofit in business long after it is um, like it'll keep you in business. It could keep you in business longer than what you need to be in business because you have this endowment. But that is an issue that the board should consider and to, to look at the big picture. But that's one of the concerns that um, some folks have about the endowment. So think about that. Let us know if you have any questions. Carl, back to you. <laughs> I forgot it was coming back to me, but yes, I'll be, I'll be really quick about this part of it. Um, I, I just, because Ash was talking about endowments, I thought it might also be useful just to talk about some business uh, activities. I'm going to be real, I'm going to be real quick since I already took up a lot of time. Related business activities are stuff you don't pay tax on. Uh, so uh, fees to your events, uh, um, tuition to your educational programs or, you know, program fees. Those are all things you don't pay tax on. Those are great. Uh, there, you should be aware that when you start trying to get creative at how you raise money, there are some ways you could do it that would start incurring taxes. Uh, uh, so unrelated, those are called unrelated business activities. There's a very technical definition, uh, things you regularly carried on that aren't furthering your exempt purpose. There's exceptions and exceptions to the exceptions and exceptions to the exceptions to the exceptions. It's a very complicated area, very tax heavy. But know that the, just to tie in Asha's point about endowments, uh, one thing that isn't taxed is interest, dividends, gains, the kind of things that if you do or do have an opportunity to take a chunk of money and set it aside, whether that's a donor created endowment or a board created endowment, with board created endowments being a lot more flexible, you know, that is a way to say, look, we can take this money, uh, make, make money tax free, that will keep us in business for a long time. Uh, those can be that those exceptions can be very useful. So be aware of these rules as you're raising money. Uh, if you're raising money through a business activity, ideally it's related. If it's not related, ideally it's passive, which are interest gains, rent, royalties, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that will that'll help make it more effective. I think I had some rules here. Um, you know, maybe Ash, I can come back to these if we get to the end and you know that might be better. But yeah, there's, there's other rules. There's always rules. Okay, cool. Um, Carl, yeah. I had a question. Oh, sure. Um, yes, it had to do with fundraising. Um, I looked up on the 990 of, of, um, of you know, nonprofit, and they claim that they like lost money on a fundraiser, but they are a multi-million dollar nonprofit that's been in business 30 years. So you know, they're they quite familiar how to do this. So are these um, filings ever checked for accuracy, or if they're hiding something? Yeah. That's a good, that's a good question. Um, so there are multiple, I, I guess I'll do like a super one quick pass. It's a, a, a couple things here. Yeah, I mean, the AG is, does supervise fundraising. People, commercial fundraisers are supervised and they actually are more kind of closely scrutinized. So if that fundraiser 
I imagine people got paid to do that fundraiser. And the people that got paid to do that fundraiser are supposed to register with the AG. They're supposed to disclose their contract and how much they're charging in there. Um, and so it is, there is a lot there that, uh, that could be applied to them. Now, is enforcement as active as some of us would like it to be? No. I will say, I mean, the fact that someone lost money on a fundraiser alone doesn't necessarily mean something was done wrong. Sometimes things just don't go the way you plan. Um, and it's not, I have, it's not unheard of for that to happen. I talk to a lot of nonprofits are like, yeah, we kind of break even on our fundraisers sometimes. You know, there's other benefits to fundraisers. They raise awareness. Maybe there's long-term impact. But that is, that, that is certainly a reason that fundraising is closely scrutinized is there's a sense that well, it seems like the only people that made money out of this fundraiser were the consultants you paid to put it on, and that seems mm -hmm. bad. Uh, and so, yeah, no, you're 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 right to question it. There could be other explanations, but you're you're definitely right to question it. And the AG might question it. The IRS potentially they ask questions about it. It's on the 990. That's how you found out about it. But um, really, it's probably more an AG question, an AG complaint question. Also, I wanted to ask you about um, aren't nonprofit. Uh, lobbyists required to register I the ones I've been checking the 990s they keep acting like they don't have lobbyists but they meet with government officials to get money but they don't seem to register as lobbyists could you talk about the rules on that yeah I could I could definitely talk about that yeah. so really quickly lobbying in the nonprofit context when you're looking at the 990 means something very specific that might be narrower then we think where it might include what you're talking about. And nonprofits are, public charities are allowed to do some degree of lobbying as long as it's insubstantial. Um, you know, and, and so yeah, you'll, you'll, if you did 990, you've seen those rules. But lobbying for a nonprofit is pretty narrow. It's talking to a legislator with a specific view about specific legislation uh, and that doesn't fall into one an, an exception. So there are lots of exceptions and there's also some room to do lobbying. So there are not lots of nonprofits that lobby. There's a lot, a lot of nonprofits that do advocacy activity, whether it's trying to get money for themselves or not. A lot will turn on whether it's uh, legislation. There's, I can go and lobby the mayor all day long, and as long as they're not talking about legislation, it's fine. Um, and so, yeah, there's, but yeah, there are nonprofits that lobby. There are nonprofits that actually register, have registered lobbyists. Typically, what a nonprofit would do that does a lot of lobbying is they might have a 501c4 which is an, uh, an action fund, you might have heard that term, or, or a PAC. Uh, and they, you know, these are the organizations that do more lobbying, but it is possible for nonprofits to lobby. Thank you. Okay. Um, and, and so I also just, like, that's a lot of, like, rules and, and regulation. What I have found working with nonprofits, a lot of folks don't think of their nonprofit as a business. I want you to really think about your nonprofit as running a business, even though it's not a for-profit business, you got to be just as buttoned up, just as knowledgeable, uh, just as resourceful, maybe even more so than the corporations that are out here making top dollar, because that's how your nonprofit is going to survive by you becoming and your board becoming really business savvy and starting to think about how you can take advantage of some of these rules. Um, Francis, the, the statement about people getting paid for fundraising was about, you know, if I'm, I don't know, a university and I'm hosting a, a, a gala, right, or some organization hosting a gala, you have, some people hire companies to do the work of sending out the invitations, setting up the tables, right. you know, like, a, it's like a wedding planner, but for a nonprofit, yeah. right, a nonprofit mm -hmm. planner. So, Carl was saying that those people, the consultants who do that, might be the only ones actually making money because the business doesn't because the expenses um, are higher than what the fundraiser raised. That's that. That was his point for that. Okay. So now I'm going to go into talking about people. Your organization obviously cannot run without people. Um, Carl, can you hit the next slide? Or what I can do is maybe I can share um, my screen and then so you don't have to figure out where I'm going next. Okay. Yeah, I think that makes sense. <laughs> Oops. Okay. Um, am I even on the right page of this? I'm way too. Thought I was already. Okay. So I'm going to start from the bottom up here. So five areas that need your immediate attention in your nonprofit. The first one I'm going to talk about is hiring practices. And then talk about the distinction between who's a volunteer and who's not. What are the proper payment practices that you have to pay attention to? And then we'll talk about supervision and what should go in your handbook. If you have any questions along the way, please do not hesitate to uh, stop me. So 
first part, hiring practices, recruiting and interviewing, and then hiring documents. So a lot of folks who run nonprofits don't realize that the anti-discrimination laws and employment law also apply to your nonprofit organization. You cannot discriminate against somebody um, or make inquiries into somebody's background based on race, religion, um, creed, color, national origin, medical condition, all of that stuff. You have to adhere to the same employment law rules that any for-profit organization adheres to as well. The only exception to that would be if, let's say, in a church, you can ask, obviously, about religious practices if the religious practices are tied to that position. But if you just have, you know, somebody coming to clean the facility every week, that person's religion or their national origin is not important to them being able to clean the facility. I just want to make you aware of that. So before, or I'm sure you all have some employees working from your, for your organization, but just review those periodically. Um, there are new rules, of course, about sex and sexual orientation, gender expression. Um, so stay on top of those as they're changing because we as business owners, as runners of organizations, we are required to know that law and the law is not very forgiving for you if you make a mistake. Ignorance is not bliss in this kind of a situation. When you onboard an employee, you must give them written notice of their rate of pay. So what is their shift? What is their hourly pay? Um, what is their overtime rate? Got to give them that information when they start. Are there any allowances that are claimed as part of minimum wage? Is there a meal or lodging allowance? Um, especially if you are running a, um, a church or religious organization, sometimes the pastors get a housing stipend or, or you're bringing somebody in. That kind of thing should be detailed in the offer letter that is given or into the confirmation that is given when you onboard an employee. They need to know about what the regular payday is. Is it the 1st and the 15th? Is it the 5th and the 20th? Is it is it some random day? Are they being paid every two weeks or twice a month? And if you happen to be a business that has a fictitious business name or a DBA, which is like a nickname, you need to tell people what is the DBA, but also what's the real name of the employer. So there shouldn't be any question about that. You also have to give written notice of the physical address of the main office, the telephone number, um, name and address and telephone number of the employer's work and co workers' compensation insurance carrier. Now, if you are running payroll through a payroll company, all of this, these things that go on the check and address and stuff, that'll be taken care of because you had to give that information to get set up. If you are handwriting checks still or have an accountant that's writing a check for you, you need to make sure that that information is properly attached to the check and also to the pay stub. Because if there's ever an issue, you're going to be held to the same standard of making sure that you have all of your documents in compliance. The, the law, employment law, California employment law does not care that you are a nonprofit. They don't give you a pass. They're not, oh, well, they mean well. Mm -mm. You're held to the same standard. You also have to give written notice of an employee's right to accrue and use sick leave. So it's a minimum of 24 hours a year in California. You have to let them know that they can actually request to use sick leave. And you need to be aware, and they also need to be aware that they should be free from termination if they choose to use sick leave, free from, free from termination or retaliation if they, if they have to use sick leave and call out sick, um, and that they are entitled to file a, a complaint against the, any employer who retaliates. And then you also just need to be aware of any other information that the labor commissioner deems is necessary. So you've got to stay on top of that or hire someone who will stay on top of that for you if your organization feels like your time would be better used elsewhere. Okay, this is mm -hmm. uh, equal pay um, in a nonprofit. I mean, the one I was studying, um, the previous worker made like a hundred thousand, and then the new person is a woman, and they maybe change the title, but it's basically the same job, and she makes a lot less. So, mm -hmm. so nonprofit workers have ha are, um, can file a cause of action on equal pay too. Yes, mm -hmm. all of the okay. same rules apply in terms of right. and how, how do you when they try to cover it up by by uh like giving them a new title but they're basically doing the same job can you challenge that yeah absolutely so you'd have to have the uh the documentation the evidence and what the either labor commissioner or the judge is going to look for is what are the responsibilities of the person under this title and then the person under that title if they are substantially similar they're essentially doing the same job the title doesn't matter they're going to look at what's the work of both parties 
Mm, thank you. Mm -hmm. So who is an employee, a contractor, and a volunteer? Now, nonprofit organizations are the only employment entity or the only entity that can actually have volunteers. But for-profits cannot have volunteers. They can have interns, but they can't have volunteers. So if someone says, hey, can you come down and volunteer for my restaurant? That, that's not actually okay. So in California, you all have, um, have probably heard of AB5. We just voted on uh, a revision of the independent contractor law most recently in November with uh, Uber. And Uber put all that money into publications for the campaign. And so as right now, as it stands, the law still hasn't changed yet. There's this thing called the ABC test. And this is actually, this is old. This is, this is not actually new. It's just come back up again and has been a little bit more refined. So everybody in California is presumed to be an employee unless the worker um, meets this test, the ABC. So A, the person is free from the control and direction of the hiring entity. Meaning, I hire you to come in and set up um, my IT department as an independent contractor. I know nothing about IT. I'm telling you that I want, want to make sure that my network is secure, but I'm not telling you how to do it. I have no control over how the IT department or contractor is implementing the services and the programs that they need to implement. So free from control. B, the person works outside of that usual course of the hiring entity's business. So if I'm running a law firm, I hire an IT consultant or contractor, I don't do IT, I do law, right? So that's different. So, but if I'm hiring someone like a paralegal to come in and work for me, well, I'm asking them to do legal stuff, I'm doing legal stuff, the presumption is that they're going to be an employee. So you should not be hiring a contractor to do the same work that your organization already does. It should be a separate piece, like an accountant could be a contractor, an attorney can be a contractor, someone to set up your marketing campaign can be a contractor, right? It's something different than what the organization does. And C, the person is customarily engaged in an independently established trade or occupation and does the work for more than one entity. If the contractor is only working for your organization, that again makes the presumption or supports the presumption that they are an employee. But if they're a contractor as an IT consultant working for my law firm, and then they go and do work for Carl's law firm, and then they go and do work for your nonprofit, and then for another organization, they are creating their own business and they're not under the supervision or relying on solely your entity or just one entity for their work. So if you're thinking about hiring people and you're like, oh, we should just do it as a contract, hire them as a contractor to make it easier and faster for us, Take a look at this ABC test, which can be found in the, this is the labor code here, or you can also just Google uh, AB5 in California and it'll bring up the same test for you. And this, you can't contract your way or agree your way into a, or out of an employer employee relationship. This is by law. And again, uh, the court doesn't really care if what you want it to be, the court is looking at, you know, what, what the actions meet the requirements of what the law says. So it's not quite negotiable. <laughs> not as negotiable as most people would want. Okay, so uh, volunteers. So again, charitable organizations, nonprofit organizations, uh, tax exempt corporations, public agencies, those are the agencies that can have volunteers. And um, it's important to know that, I'm sure most of you all have volunteers, but here are some things to uh, pay attention to. Are the volunteer activities in question the same or similar to the activities that the employee is employed to perform? So if you have an employee working for you and then they go and volunteer, let's say, I see this example sometimes on, on, in churches on Sundays, right? You have um, uh, the receptionist in the office or secretary in the office doing work during the week. And then on Sunday, he or she comes in and is doing the same type of work on Sunday collecting ties, putting it away, you know, making sure things go well, but they're not paid for the work on Sunday because Sunday's a volunteer day. It's not going to fly. That's the same work that they are doing during the week that they are paid for. So they cannot now all of a sudden be a volunteer just because it's Sunday or it's Saturday, whatever day, right? Um, the volunteer work should be different than what they are paid for. And it also should be outside the normal working hours for the employee. And then there also must be no contemplation of pay. So if someone says, hey, I really need a job, um, 
I can come and clean up the grounds for you. You say, well, why don't you just volunteer first and we'll see how it goes. But they've told you that they really need the job and they're looking for pay. And now they're relying, well, okay, they told me that I could come and volunteer, but they're hoping to get that job. That's not a good way to start because if there's ever a complaint and the labor commissioner says, or the judge says, well, why did you think you would be paid? And they recount that conversation. You can see how there would be an expectation of pay there. So there has to be no expectation, no contemplation of being paid. All right, proper payment practices, hourly rates and uh, salary, and then love offerings. Okay, so again, if you're using a payroll company, you're probably in the clear for all of this, but um, pay, payment has to be made semi-monthly, so twice a month or every two weeks, or you know, it can't be made once a month and it can't be made less, it can't be made less than two times a month, I'll say it like that. On the pay sum, there needs to be an accounting of the gross wages earned, the total hours worked, the amount of sick leave that's available for use, any deductions, and then the net wages earned. So again, using a payroll company, they will automatically generate this pay stub for you as the business and also for the worker. If you are not using a payroll company, you still need to be able to provide this information along with the paycheck every two weeks or twice a month. Um, whatever the uh, payment schedule is for that. So here's some, some more requirements on there that I will let you take a look at so we can keep moving through. Pay attention to the minimum wage. Minimum wage in California goes up every single year. Right now, California's minimum wage is $14 an hour. If you have 26 or few, fewer than 26 employees, so 25 or fewer employees, I'm sorry, 26 or more employees is $14 an hour. If you have fewer than 26, if you have 25 or below, then it's $13 an hour. And you usually get one year to catch up to what the rate is. But usually by the time that year goes along, there's already a new minimum wage in California. Oakland, it's the same idea. Uh, $14 an hour in Oakland is the minimum wage for 26 or more employees. And then $13 an hour if an organization has fewer, 25 or fewer. So pay attention to that. Also, if, you, if your organization requires employees to work in different um, counties or in different cities, you as the, whoever is responsible for payroll or managing the employees needs to pay attention to what the minimum wage is in that city. So San Francisco, I'm not even sure exactly what it is in San Francisco right now, but it's higher. It's always higher than Oakland or usually anywhere else. So if you have an employee running a program across the bridge in San Francisco, and they're there for more than two hours a week, their time in San Francisco needs to be compensated the higher minimum wage, okay? So if you're already paying everybody above minimum wage, then you don't have to worry about it, but minimum wage is dependent upon the location. It's important to, to pay attention to. Um, I will just cover this briefly. Uh, a lot of folks, I think, are looking at paying what, who would normally be an hourly employee, they're looking at paying them a salaried wage because they think it's easier, it might be cheaper. Um, a salaried employee who is not exempt as an administrative executive or professional, that you have, they have to be paid at least twice the state minimum wage per hour. And, you know, and, and that work week is defined as 40 hours per week. So People generally like to do salaried work because, or employers like to have folks on salary because you're not counting the hours that they're there. But if the person would normally be an hourly employee, meaning they don't like fall into one of these exceptions of administrative, executive, or professional, then you still have to pay attention to the amount of hours that they're working. And if it's over 40 hours a week, their, their breakdown of the hourly wage has to be at least twice the state minimum wage per hour. So pay attention to that. Um, and then gifts and love offerings. So be careful, again, when giving gifts or love offerings for people or volunteers doing things, right? You don't, in my opinion, you don't want to hand out gift cards to volunteers because that gift card has a monetary value. That might be easy to say, oh, well, I volunteered for four hours and got a $50 gift card. Um, so that means I'm making, you know, twelve fifty an hour. I think that my math is right on that, right? Um, you, you, but you could take all the volunteers out to lunch or, you know, throw a party for the volunteers. You just want to be careful that it's not in direct exchange 
for an hour, an hourly um, rate. It doesn't look like it's compensation for hourly work. Okay, so just just pay attention to that. And uh, supervision, almost done, y'all. Is there a question? Because um, that's commonly done in San Francisco is these gift cards. Um, mm -hmm. I know the hospital and nonprofits, it's, and people love it because they're on SSI. So, so how can these, um, like it's folk rehab at general and others, how can they protect themselves from, because it helps apparently the people to feel insecure about their benefits, but how can they protect mm -hmm. themselves from what you're saying? Yeah, I would say, you know, find another way to express the appreciation, some way that doesn't have a direct monetary value of it. You know, because you're thinking about, as attorneys, we're trying to think about the worst case scenario, not, not when things could go right, but we're always trying to think about when things could go wrong. So if someone is coming and volunteering regularly at the church and every week they get, you know, a $50 gift card to Amazon or to Safeway or something like that, that begins to look like it is compensation for the volunteer hours, which then begins to look like it could be payment for the hours that are worked. So you know, maybe the difference is that you just go and buy groceries or maybe, um, I don't know, there's an appreciation dinner or, you know, they get a sweatshirt or something like that. I understand that you want to be able to give people um, something that actually helps. And I'm not, I'm, I just want you to be aware of what the rules are. So then don't you and the board can sit down with an attorney and make the best decision for the board to keep y'all out of hot water. So um, there, are, there are ways to do it. And I would think that would have to be an individual decision for each organization and what makes, sense, what makes the most sense. Arlene? Thank you. Yes, I was wondering, uh, lately there's a, a big thing with leadership academies and cohorts and uh, various things of that sort where uh, it's, it's the norm to give gift cards. Is that, that's different from volunteering. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and so, um, Leadership Academy as it is coming like a certificate of appreciation sort of a thing or hey you you pass this let's give you a gift card that kind of are you talking about with children or how does that happen I'm talking about I'm talking about people like with a lot of organizations they're now this diversity equity and inclusion so they're bringing in people with lived experiences so the people mm -hmm. that they're bringing in they're designing this thing called cohorts leadership Academy so they give them various names to bring in people and uh, for them to become informed. Then they give out gift cards with this. Sometimes mm -hmm. they give out cap, uh, checks if they, are, if they don't have an address. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I was wondering, is that the same as the volunteer? Or is this no, I think that's different because those folks are coming to learn. They're not, they're not volunteering and doing work that would or ordinarily be paid. Right. right? So okay. this is for if some, you know, the person who stays after on Wednesdays always to clean up you know, the space when the kids are gone and routinely they're paid or they're shown their appreciation in the form of a gift card or Absolutely. some kind of stipend, but they're called a volunteer. That's different from having someone go through a course or an academy. And then as part of that, they get, you know, some reward so, or donation. Okay. So it's finite. Okay. I got it. And they're not doing it re repetitiously. Thank right. you. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You just want to make sure that you're not confused because again, Nonprofit organizations and charitable organizations get the benefit of not having to pay taxes because they're doing good work in the community. But that also means you have a heightened responsibility to make sure that you are adhering to the rules and the regulations, because if you're not, well, why should you get to get free labor um, and this other organization shouldn't if you're not following the rules? So that's the lens that the government is, is looking through. They want to make sure that you're still following the rules. The public is getting the benefit of it, and you're not just, you know, taking advantage of something that you don't actually have a right to take advantage of. So that's the perspective. Okay, um, supervision is uh, really important um, for uh, nonprofit organizations. We don't really think about it that much. I, in my, in my opinion, I don't think we pay enough attention to this. So you are responsible. Or your organization is responsible for the volunteers and the employees that are representing the organization. Okay, so generally, um, uh, a, generally a business won't be responsible unless the employer or volunteer is furthering the interest of the employer. So if um, 
let's say you're trying to sell t-shirts to raise awareness of a concert that you all have coming up at the church and you're standing on the street and somebody, um, a volunteer does something inappropriate, the organization is going, probably going to be responsible for that volunteer's actions because that volunteer was furthering the interest of the organization, right? They weren't just off on their own doing something random. The, the um, organization was getting the benefit of the um, volunteer's work. The employer was negligent in hiring the employer contractor. So, and this applies to volunteers and also employees. So if you hired somebody who um, wasn't actually qualified to do the work, um, if you didn't do, I'm talking about it a little bit later, but if you hire or allow someone to work with kids and they have you know, a background that says that they shouldn't be working with the children, you know, did you ask enough questions? Did you really vet them for the position that um, they had applied for or asked to be in a leadership role for? And then also, if there isn't enough supervision of the employee, the volunteers. So just because you have someone coming in or a volunteer coming in, it doesn't mean that you are absolved from making sure that that the employee or volunteer behaves properly amongst the folks who are uh, other co-workers in the organization or interacting with the general public. You still have responsibility for that. Um, this is not the uh, most polite example, but you know, I remember um, being a little bit like in my early 20s and um you know some <laughs> i i'm just gonna go ahead and say some of the older gentlemen at church were making comments to some of the younger women in the dresses and it made us really really uncomfortable and so a few of us started talking to you know the leadership team and the leadership team needed to address that because now this is something that is happening within the organization they're aware of it and you can't just go oh hands off right you are also responsible for those kinds of actions uh, if it's with an employee or a volunteer. You still have a responsibility to keep people safe. May I ask a question, please? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. It's Francis. So <clears throat> for organizations that, uh, nonprofit organizations that, mm -hmm. ment that mentor uh, uh, young people under 18, mm -hmm. So is there a requirement that we do background checks when we bring in new volunteers? And it, you know, I don't, I don't, go ahead, I'm sorry. In, ca in California, I know other states have them, but I, uh, in California, we do vet them, but I'm, we're, we're now at the point where we're trying to figure out, do we have to do background checks? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. I can look up and see whether or not there actually is a requirement. I think it would be a good practice because the elderly are considered vulnerable in our country and also children are considered vulnerable. So if you happen, you just don't want to put your organization in a situation mm -hmm. where somebody else, some judge or third party says, well, they should have investigated a little bit more into the background. This person had unsupervised time with these five children. They're all making the same complaint. You know, you just really want to protect that so you can protect the reputation of your organization. So you're saying proactively, we should be considering doing background checks. I think so. I think so. I mean, imagine mm -hmm. if something came out with some volunteer inappropriately spoke to one of the children or inappropriately touched right. one of the children. It's, it's, yeah, I would say take that preventative measure because, you know, at least if you did all of the pieces that you could have done as an organization, you can say, right. hey, we did our part. We stand behind these kids. That person's no longer there. We had no idea. We had no reason to know that kind of a thing and that'll help protect your organization. Okay, we do other things and you know, the children aren't along with one person. I mean, there are mm -hmm. a number of things that we're currently doing, but the background checks just came up. So thank you so much. Yeah, and I'll, I will look and, and send that back to uh, Occur to make sure that I'm, I have a legal answer for you, but in terms okay. of best practices, I think that that would be a good one too. Thank you. Yeah, um, so also think about what kind of trainings you need to provide, right? Are there physical safety, is physical safety an issue? Um, what about mental health and, and workplace safety? You know, how do you need to train your volunteers? You need to um, pay attention. You just need to know who is working in and around your organization. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not telling you to exclude people maybe who have a criminal record or, 
you know, have had uh, hard times or who may be uh, formerly using drugs or coming off drugs or alcohol. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying make sure that you know who's working in your organization and that they are trustworthy because they are a representation of your organization. And by extension, you have a legal responsibility for what they do on behalf of your organization. Okay, last thing. I got pockets so fast. I have a question on that subject. Okay. Uh huh. I, ask, uh, I want to ask you, uh, like, say churches, you know, have retreats and overnights. Um, so, do you have any recommendations around, um, you know, safety of minors? You know, when churches have things like that. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think about, you know, so all the little kids camps that I did. Um, and, and what that looked like. So I, I like what Francis said about not having children around just one volunteer at a time, making sure there's always at least two uh, adults, you know, never one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and I, I would, I mean, you have to have the waivers from the parents, not, not you know, for like the, um, if there's a, an auto accident or something like that, right? The parents are giving permission for the kids to go away. You're not stealing the kids from the parents. Um, they know that just an accident could happen. Um, I would really think about what it is that is going to happen and where are the vulnerable spaces for the children and not just with the adults and the kids, but also is it a space where a kid could wander off? Is it a space where a kid could, you know, bring some drug paraphernalia or alcohol and, you know, now four or five of them are drinking at summer camp, you know? Um, what about the phones and, and, you know, passing pictures around and text messaging and things like that. You got to think about bullying these days. Your interaction is probably much shorter than what it is, of course, at school. But um, I think it's very, it's specific to what you were doing, what you're trying to accomplish. And um, I would, I would probably sit down with an attorney and see what are the things that you need to have, what are the things that you need to put in place? And then what are the extra safety measures, practices that we can put to protect our organization? So I think you'd rather have more protections so you can say, hey, these are all the things that we did. This, this incident was so far out of our control or so far out of our realm of imagination um, that our liability here is really minimal as opposed to, oh, we just said, you know, let go and let God and then all this stuff happens and the court's like, uh, God probably told you to hire an expert, you know? <laughs> Right. I'm concerned also about like between children. Um, there was an incident when my son was in Boy Scouts that could have went to the police, but I think they probably hired mediators and had all these meetings because there was, uh, you know, some, I guess, the older kids um, scaring some younger kids with some disturbing behavior, potentially criminal behavior. But I mean, it, it was pretty, you know, I just... So yeah, it's not just adults, it's even, you know, the right yeah. super children mm -hmm. even. Yeah, and, and bullying these days is interesting because there isn't really a cause of action for bullying. Um, you know, they're trying to get the law to catch up because there are young people, of course, who have taken their own lives from bullying, but who, you know, how do you assign responsibility? Um, you know, what are the elements that you have to be, meet for bullying? That doesn't mean though, that just because it, there isn't a legal cause of action for it doesn't mean that you're not going to end up having to defend the actions that your organization took or didn't take in that incident. So you want to just not have your organization even be in a conversation about it. But you are absolutely right. There has to be um, not just barriers between the adults and the kids or supervision there, but also supervising the kids and paying attention to what they're doing. The age of the children also really makes a difference. If someone's a teenager, let's say they're 15 or 16, they have much more agency than a 10 year old. They require different super, they require supervision in a different kind of a way because they probably have their phones and are, you know, doing whatever 16 and 17 year olds do. Whereas the six and seven year olds are susceptible in a different way. You know, they're probably not bullying each other the same way the older kids could possibly bully each other. So it depends on your organization, the population, where you're going, how long you're going, who's involved, um, all that kind of stuff. And then I had a question as far as um, these organizations, like at camp once, one, there was a what appeared to be a suicide attempt, and then basically the person was not welcome back. It was in Boy mm -hmm. Scouts. Um, is, is that legal? for an organization to exclude somebody who, who exhibited like a mental health crisis? 
So the uh, best attorney answer I can give you is it depends. Um, and based on what you gave me, I don't have enough facts to give you a legal opinion about it, but I do know that the attorney who advised them is going to be looking at um, safety concerns for the individual and safety concerns for the, the other folks that are involved. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And also, you know, our protected categories uh, are ace, rage, religion, national origin, those kinds of things, right? Um, mm -hmm. I don't think that you are in a protected category. I mean, it, because of mental health, you know, it, it depends, right? It depends on how you're being discriminated against. Um, certain organizations, I mean, organizations will say, like, hey, if you don't have a shirt on, you can't come in to this space. They have applications. If you don't fit what we're looking for, which of course fit is a, can be problematic, um, they have the right to turn folks away. So it just depends on the situation. Okay, so I recommend that organizations have a volunteer and employee handbooks that cover most of the stuff that I've already talked about. This handbook, now here's the thing about handbooks and policies. If you write it down, you need to follow it. So make sure that by the time you, you create this employee or volunteer handbook or employee slash volunteer handbook, your organization is ready to follow the rules and the policies that are set out in this this handbook because I mean you see it all the time with like uh, late policies or tardy policies right that you know you if you show up 15 minutes late to work then you will have a written you know notification or reprimand in your file supervisors chummy with a couple of people you know they never do the write-up and then someone else comes and it's their fourth day and they just don't get along with the supervisor now all of a sudden the supervisor wants to put that in the file but they didn't do that for these other people so that is going to be an issue as an employment attorney that's going to be an issue that I'm going to raise how come you treated you didn't follow the handbook for these other folks how come you didn't how come you chose to follow it here so all that to say again when you create this handbook and you roll it out make sure that your organization is ready to adhere to the rules and regulations within the handbook it is like your rule book to the game it's your guidebook it allows you to communicate general policies with employees employees can go back and volunteers can go back and look it up you know, they don't always have to call HR, email HR, or the supervisor or director. It's something that you can go back and refer to time and time again. I mean, I still do that now. I teach uh, at a community college also. And when I'm trying to figure out what are my leave policies, I'm looking at that bad boy, <laughs> you know, repeatedly, right? Where that saves me time and saves HR time. I don't have to go to them. Make sure that your handbook is clear and concise. Don't put more in there than what you need, but make sure you've got, you know, the important things that are in there. And that's it for me. I've, I've used all of my air today. <laughs> Do you all have any questions for either Carl or myself? Hey, Asha, I believe we have a, an answered question in the chat. Okay. Um, it's circling back on to uh, minimum wage, uh, well, touching on living wage. Um, the question is, what is a nonprofit's requirement regarding, if any, uh, regarding uh, a li living wage? So we don't really have such a thing as living wage uh, legally, right? We all know that minimum wage is not actually a living wage. So legally, the only responsibility that you have as an organization is to pay the minimum wage. I do think that especially as nonprofit organizations that are trying to help the people to pay a living wage is a great thing to do. I think that is a big struggle, especially when, with organizations, um, uh, I don't even think organization of color is the right thing, but organizations that are working in communities that are under um, underfunded, there's this idea that if you're working for the people, you can't make money either. But I remember my dad told me, me. He was like, Asha, if you don't get your money right, you're going to need the same services as everybody you're trying to help. So <laughs> you want the people um, working in your organization to be well-funded enough that they can come to work, do a great job at what they do, and make changes in the community. So I think it's great to talk about paying a living wage and not just minimum wage. Yeah, I'll just, I'll um, just second that as something that a good nonprofit board can, you know, when you're, one thing the board does is talk about mission, mission, vision, and a great, a great conversation for them to have is, well, we know what the minimum wage is, but we as a, where this is our organizational value is always pay a living wage. And I'm, I'm sure there are organizations that do it. I'm sure there are more organizations that 
I would love to do it. Uh, and and um, obviously, budget's always the thing, but it, it, yeah, it's great to see nonprofits lead on that. Yeah, definitely. I have a uh, message in my chat. So can a church apply for a social outreach arm separately as a 501c3, so to safeguard the church from liabilities? Um, Carl, I'll let you answer that one. And then the second part of that is what is the form or process on how to file a 501c3? Um, and then she said, thank you to both of us for the presentation. I can answer the second one. I think a lot of folks don't know, especially if you're stepping into an organization um, that's already been formed, but nonprofits mostly are corporations. You file for a corporation with the Secretary of State, and then what you're looking for is the tax exempt status. And it like, don't go off and do it on your own because there are different types of corporations with the Secretary of State. So you want to make sure that you are choosing the right one. And then that part that most people are looking at, that 501c3 part is the tax exempt status. And if I do it, I generally do with the IRS first. And then that letter, that approval letter, um, I can just send that to the Franchise Tax Board. And then I send, uh, give that information also to the Attorney General's office to register as a charity. And then beyond that, there's the internal documents that Carl talked about earlier, needing the bylaws that have to be specifically written for a nonprofit organization. And depending on what type of nonprofit, you have some certain rules. So for example, um, a nonprofit can't sell off, if it decides to close down, you can't sell off your stuff like a for-profit corporation. You have to either designate another 501c3 or nonprofit organization or give it away. Yeah, yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll just, to, yeah, totally, that's all, that's all right. And you, if you go back to the slides I had on, uh, on, on the different agencies, I'll help you kind of walk through what the process is because it's getting right with those four agencies. On the first part of the question, I just so everyone has the, 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 the benefit of it, I think there's always a big decision when you want to set up a new arm, do we need a new entity or not? And sometimes organizations default to the second entity and, you know, there's some advantages to a second entity, um, you know, in terms of, but, but, you know, you'll, but then you'll have all the, you know, you'll double your obligation, you'll double your filing obligations, you'll double, you'll double some of your, your accounting expenses, your, your legal expenses, you'll have to do, you know, you know, and sometimes it's worth it when it's a big enough project, or maybe you're one kind of entity and the entity that's going to raise money needs to be another kind of entity. One thing I, I encourage nonprofits to think about is to set up an LLC. Uh, you know, LLCs are separate entities for liability purposes when done right. They are separate entities for state law purposes but they are disregarded entities for federal tax purposes. So if you already have an exempt organization, um, you can effectively set up a new chapter, a new whatever you wanna call it with a new LLC. This is, the, this is the LLC's name, that's what we're gonna call this thing. And it all shows up on the books of the parent nonprofit for tax purposes. You, you effectively get to share your exemption with that LLC. That's always gonna be the more cost effective way to start. And so you could do it, you could do all those steps or Set up a, uh, and, and like I said, there's lots of situations where that's a good idea, or I've seen the say, look, we, we want this little thing, we want different people running it, we, or we want to contain the liabilities of this activity, maybe it's, you know, working with kids, maybe it's working with uh, other stuff that could generate liability, and so we're going to set up an LLC and put, put, put that all in this little bucket over here, uh, either, either one of those can be effective. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and definitely, you know, don't hesitate to bring an attorney into the conversation with the board because, you know, we're talking generally about things, but every decision you make will be specific and dependent on what you, your organization is doing. What are the, like, what is the skill set that you have of folks inside the organization? What is the capacity? What does the money look like? What are the activities that are, are going to be done? So definitely bring somebody in to help you make that decision. Yeah. Um, Stephen the, had a. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Carl. I was going to take Stephen's question. It was, okay. It was yeah. that, how do you switch board members in your 501c3? The answer go look at your bylaws. Uh, your bylaws uh, will tell you how you know, uh, directors are elected. Uh, the usual answer is that directors are elected for certain terms. When their terms come up, usually it's the board that elects their successors. You might have something in your bylaws that says, actually, it's Carl that appoints your, your directors. And then you would go, okay, Carl, we need another director. Uh, that, you know, but in general, you're typically going to find it's the board that elect directors typically when their term is up. And if you're not sure when everyone's terms up, that's a good sort of process to go through of like, okay, well, let's get our board roster updated. When is everyone's terms up? When, when are we going to do the next election? You know, typically director, you know, organizations should have annual meetings. That's typically where you do the election of directors is anyone who's expiring and the election of officers. 
Mm -hmm. And those documents, do your bylaws, you know, review them every year. So if you, if you haven't seen the bylaws for your organization within the last 12 months, it's time to go look at them again. I call them a living, breathing document. They should accurately reflect what your organization is trying to do in this moment. Because again, thinking worst case scenario, if there's an issue and a judge or a mediator has to go back and ask what document you're using, what rules are you playing by, if they're going to go back to the most recent set of bylaws, but if those bylaws are from 10 years ago and are completely different than how you're operating now, now you're going to have an issue trying to explain and, and just have a much harder time trying to explain why the judge should listen to you instead of going with the document that is an official business document. And I have, I have seen cases where, um, not, I don't think in a nonprofit board, but uh, with a for-profit corporation where a board member was being removed and said that the board didn't follow the rules and sued the organization, the judge said, well, where's this document? Where's that document? The corporation couldn't produce it. The judge said, you're not a properly formed entity. You got to start over. So they dismantled the company and had to start over because there are some documents that are required, even if they don't get filed with somebody. So you want to make sure that your documents are current and up to date. And, you know, I don't know, Carl, what do you think? Should the outgoing board update the bylaws like at the end of the year? Or do you think the incoming um, board should do it in the beginning? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I do think if your outgoing board hasn't looked at something in a while, they should look at it. And usually for most mm -hmm. boards, there's going to be a lot of continuity from one to the other. So I wouldn't draw a line and say, well, one should do it or the other. But I, I would say that, look, when a, you know, when you're a new director, the first thing you should do is review your bylaws. And if you're not clear on something, you think something's wrong. You, you know, you should, that should, you could start that conversation. The other thing, I mean, it just was, is dead on that, you know, these things can add up to a problem. All these things that seem like, oh, it's just paperwork. It's all just paperwork at the start, but these things can snowball. And and when they snowball, the, the more they snowball, the messier it gets. I also think that there's a, to, on a related point to what Ash was saying is like, you sort of, when, if there's ever going to be a problem, you will wish that you were the one that wrote the first story and so what you can think about as the board is your job is to as you're going in your minutes and your policies is to write the story of what you're doing because if you don't write the story of what you're doing if something goes wrong uh that reporter that uh disgruntled board member that disgruntled employee is going to write the story of what you were doing and that's the story people are going to believe because the first story tends to be what people believe right. and so contemporaneously documenting what you're doing as you're going you know documenting we're going is really important yeah so keeping those minutes staying up to date. It, it is a lot of responsibility. So if you're, if you're shocked about how much responsibility it, it is, um, welcome to the world of running, <laughs> running a nonprofit. But put those dates on the calendar and make sure that your organization sticks to them. Every January, we're going to review the bylaws and you know, XYZ document. And so it's just there. So you don't have to think about it. You don't have to have that stress and worry about when it's not done. And especially if you are a board member, remember, you have a responsibility to act in the best interest of the organization. So if somebody, um, uh, based on a lot of Denise's questions, she's somebody who looks to see what other organizations are doing. There are other folks who are going to be trying to hold you accountable and hold your feet to the fire. And so you want to avoid any personal liability by making sure that you are helping your organization stay up to date in regular, in regular contact with reviewing the documents and uh, that kind of thing to, to stay out of trouble. Um, I have a question, and this has to do with a church. Um, there's an, a very old church in, the, in San Francisco that's uh, very close to being sold, uh, the campus for uh, 15 mil. And the um, one person, uh, one person in the church agreed with it, but hundreds do not and have no voice. And it's an almost a done deal. And this was, we'll leave, you know, like there are people in their 90s. This is a very old church, almost 100 years old. And um, so what, uh, but it is not, a, it's a church, it's not a nonprofit. Uh, so what um, recourse um, do the, even the lawyer there kind of give up, like give it to God and we're praying for a miracle. And, uh, but I mean, what legal liability do, do the people have who are making this deal? I can speak to that a bit. So, I mean, as a starting point, so a church isn't always a nonprofit. It might be a nonprofit. It might could also be incorporated some other way. So if a church very well might have articles and bylaws that will say who has rights to, to do things. But in general, you can assume that the board or whatever the equivalent body is, is going to be charged with making that decision. 
um, you know, the, to the extent someone else has a say, it might be the Attorney General. That being said, the Attorney General's authority with respect to churches is pretty limited. Uh, you know, they might have gotten notice. Usually when there's a sale of substantially all assets, the AG will need to get notice and it will have a chance to say, no, this isn't fair market value. No, you're handing charitable resources off to somebody else. Um, but they have the theoretical power to step in. If they got enough complaints on, the, you know, on their complaint form, they might consider doing that. That would, that would be sort of the mechanism. Other than that, the things that work are just you know, public opinion, public pressure. But at the end of the day, there, there are a lot of, you know, one thing that, um, as, as Osh was talking about endowments, one thing that I thought about is how many organizations um, are going out of business or are in tough times because of, you know, COVID-19 and that having killed a lot of their revenue sources. And so there's a lot of organizations um, that are entering into those big transactions that are controversial. Um, you know, Mills College over in, in, in East Bay is a good example of that, right? So um, this is where, you know, the directors have to make their best fiduciary decision. The AG gets to say, the public only gets sort of an indirect say and they can try to nudge the AG in the direction they want them to go or to pressure the directors to vote the way they want, but that, that, that is sort of the full, the full extent of it. Um, well, the issue is that the money they could probably get more for it, but that not there's been no provision for uh, the pastor who relocated with three minor children uh, less than, about two years ago, and and uh, for this um, uh, whatever members of the congregation who are you know um, like you know widows, elders, people with disability. Uh, and don't have wheels to go to Benicia, the, the one they joined up with who's making this decision. So so this money, um, is there any um, accountability about that none of it basically is going to the people that generated it over the last 100 years? So there's, in, in a couple of ways, I mean, 90% of the answer is it's a board, it's a board decision or whatever the board equivalent of the church is. And they, they their business judgment is, is what gives rule the day and they should take into consideration all those factors. If there are directors that disagree and they think what the other directors are doing is a breach of fiduciary duty, that's one thing. But I would say there's a 90 plus percent chance that this is just falls in the category of business judgment and it supports business judgment to make. And they, and that, that's what will, that's what will govern. I do, I do want to just know one, you know, I skipped over my charitable trust solicitation patient slide, um, but one, a, one kind of key principle from that is, in addition to whatever your articles say, and I'll, this will touch on Arlene's question too, um, you know, one way in which you are limited in terms of what you can do is what your articles say. Another way in which you're limited is what you're, if your donors give you money for a specific purpose. So if donors have been donating to this church for all these years, uh, without any restrictions, you know, in the collection plate or just general support money, uh, th there's not going to be a specific purpose restriction other than what's in the articles. If, however, people are like, well, this is for this church, like this is, I'm donating money for religious activities to be conducted in this town or this, you know, wherever, there actually is, there can be a purpose restriction in terms of how it must be used. Uh, so there are limitations there. That's something the board's got to stay within, and that's something the AG may have power to enforce. And just a quick pivot to Arlene's question with that, what if your nonprofit changes direction of work or expanded or new mission, uh, whether well, documents will be affected? Uh, step one is go look at your articles and look at what your purposes say. If they're too narrow for what you're about to do, good time to go back and amend your articles. And honestly, when you amend those articles, just make it as broad as possible to say everything within 501c3. That way you don't have to have this conversation again. Uh, two, uh, yeah, mission statement policy statement is great. But three, the other restriction, like I just mentioned in response to Denise's question, well, what did donors give you the money for? So if, if you raised a bunch of money saying, I'm going to do program A, and now I want to go do program B instead, I'd say, well, if you raised any money that was specifically for program A, like either, either donors said, this is for program A, or you solicited donors with materials that said, give to program A, and they gave, that's, those are restricted funds, and they need to be for program A. New funds can be for program B, but old funds are only for program A. Um, other than that, the only other thing that'll pop up is when you file your 990, there's a question, uh, if you're not a church anyway, and you file a 990, you will, there's a question that says, did you start any new uh, programs this year? You'll get a chance to disclose. That's, that's kind of your, you don't have to do a new exemption application, but that's kind of where your opportunity is to say, hey, here's the new charitable thing we're doing. Well, I have a question, like the, the, this older church just joined up with 
the one in, you know, Benicia, say about two years ago. Um, so it appears now that we were just lucrative real estate. So, um, but they joined in trust because it was our church plant and the person who grew up there was the pastor who has since just retired just in time that he won't be blamed for it all. But um, so, so can you, is there a challenge you can make that this um, joining together or whatever you call it, it was not done in good faith on the part of this other one that now within two years, you know, has determined that, uh, you know, we're an albatross or something and, you know, they can get 15 mil and, and stuff like that. So can we, so, you know, a case be, Denise, I, didn't... Would, I would encourage that, that if the board has an issue, you with that to the folks on the board who have an issue to go seek out the advice and counsel of an attorney mm -hmm. and to bring as many documents and evidence as you can because that is going to help the attorney actually determine what has been done what may or may not have been proper and then they can give you um, a better explanation because like we don't we don't have enough facts about the situation to to be able to give you a good answer we definitely don't want to send you off running down, you know, some road, and then there's another document that would change change the game on that. So I would there's recommend. You could read on that subject board. that you would recommend about about um, you know determining um, good faith of these agreements. Just a general legal principle or something about good faith. Uh, where I would point you to is the AG's website. They have some resources for this. Um, I, I, I'm glad Ash is here to keep us responsible. I, I think, uh, yeah, because she's right. These are super fact intensive. Start with, with the AG's website and their materials. They, they provide materials to people involved in nonprofits to help them understand mm -hmm. the rules and um, how these things might come up. Um, and that, I, that's probably the, the best place I'd start with. If, if I can think of something else, I'll send it in the chat. But I, I think that's where I would go first. I used to work for the state bar and I won an, won an unemployment case that they to deny me. So that was fun. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks so much. Um, well, I was on the topic of the AG and the charitable, so uh, we kind of, I skipped over this when we were governor, but now I'm going to use the opportunity just to mention two things. And I don't want to share the PowerPoint, but I just want to make sure. So the two bullets on that that I wanted to bring up were one, raffles. Um, one thing that you've probably, there's sort of a, a theme in nonprofit law, which is we have a lot of rules and we don't always have a lot of enforcement and nowhere is that more true than raffles. Because uh, raffles are effectively always, almost always illegal, <laughs> unless you're unless you're a nonprofit and unless you register in advance. Uh, and so this is an area of a lot of noncompliance. I will say, if your organization has done raffles, think about doing raffles. Look up the AG has resources on this. Look them up. Look how you can do it legally, because that is that is one area I want to make sure I at home. Because this is probably the thing that people are always surprised when I tell them what the rule is. Because you know, in general, raffles are. A uh, game of chance that could reward in a prize, which makes it gambling, which makes it illegal unless you fall in an exception, and the exception is narrower than people think. So I encourage you to look that up. The other thing I would, uh, they, there's the guide for charities. Thank you, Asha. Uh, and the other, the other thing on a similar, you know, commercial co-ventures. If you are doing a, something with a company and the company is saying, uh, for every dollar you buy from us, we're donating ten cents to this charity. There's a whole regulatory scheme that goes into it. In California, it, there are simple agreements you can enter to make it a lot simpler. Um, it, you know, if it's a broader uh, campaign, it's much more complicated. This is another good one. You know, I even as a lawyer, like I, I, I know that nonprofits have limited budgets, and it's always great when you can find sort of free resources, free resources for stuff. There are certain things that um, are worth that conversation, at least at a consultation and give you kind of like, what are the what are the things I should be thinking about? So when it comes to sort of those sort of revenue generating activities, raffles, um, uh, commercial co-ventures, honestly, you know, setting up new 501c3s, uh, I, I sort of do recommend that if you can, to try to have that conversation. I have a question about new nonprofits. Do you suggest after a specific period of time, uh, evaluation of what your current programs are in order to adjust your mission statements? If you're too narrow in what you originally wrote or stated? Um, I'll just, I'll start, I'll start with Yasha's other point. I, it, it's never too early to go back to your articles and amend them to make the purposes broader. So I would start, if your articles, if your articles have a narrow purpose, go back and 
uh, you know, do an amendment to, to make them broader because you never know what's going to happen. So like I would, and you always have flexibility. If you, if you make your articles, uh, purpose articles broad, you always have flexibility to change or to be as narrow as broad as you want. So start there. In terms of just ongoing program evaluation, you know, I don't think there's any, there's no bright line there. I, I, I think, you know, organizations, I think are constantly using, you know, I think of using your annual board meeting for that kind of long-term planning or are our missions, are we staying, standing by our mission statement? Have we evolved as an organization? Does that change how we think about ourselves? Those kind of things at annual meetings, but on the narrow legal question of amending your articles, uh, every, I'll just tell you every time I, a client comes in and I see their articles and it says something narrow, I say, let's just make sure we change that now. Because 10 years from now, you're going to be talking to me about how you want to do something totally different, you know. And I also think it's good, again, to just review every year because, you know, when you're asking for money from folks, the more data that you have about your program, how many people you've served, what's the outcome, um, and that requires checking in. It also probably requires someone who's well-versed in data collection. Like, that is not my skill. <laughs> and understanding the impact. Like, I can read the report. I probably write the report, but the data collection is not my skill set. So that will just really help you be able to talk to the public about what we've been doing. This is how it's been working. This is why you should be donating more money to us. So I definitely recommend meeting at least once a year to do those things and to um, stay updated. Because you, the worst thing is to be headed down this path and be so committed to the mission, you find that the mission's not working. Maybe we think, you know, we're gonna run this after school program, but really what kids really need is like food or something like that. We've missed the mark because we didn't, we didn't evaluate, we didn't pivot. Just as an example, I think after school programs are great. Is that, is that like a statement of priorities of what your organization does? I think a lot of organizations have that or a mission statement. You know, it can be as formal or as informal as you want. But what I would say is for the people you have on your board, what's going to help them think about this stuff? Because you should be thinking about it. You don't have to write up any particular way, but you should be having the conversation. So whatever's useful for you is what I would say. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Did we did we talk y'all out of sleep? Well, I have a zillion. I just don't want to hog it. <laughs> no, go ahead. Uh, I'm also going to remind folks that we are going to do a clinic next month. Um, so if you do have more, if you want more time, you have more questions, you can always chime in for that. Um, we can give a couple more minutes. So, uh, Miss Arlene, if you want to ask your question, go ahead. You're on mute, Miss Arlene. Oh, I'm sorry. With some of the nonprofits, uh, some of the people that I know, I sometimes help them with whatever they need to be, you know, do research or whatever. I find that over the course of like two, two to three years, they find that what they were initially doing is not what is actually needed. And they don't know that in the beginning. Mm -hmm. They only find that out after the fact. And so trying to learn how to navigate uh, when you expand your mission, how do you go about finding the funds for when you've adjusted versus what you initially were? Uh, I, I find a lot of nonprofits are struggling with how, how do you do that? Not just in changing your mission or your purpose, but where do you go further? Right. I think that that, I mean, I think that problem is probably compounded for nonprofits because money is donated for generally speaking for a specific cause and so you can't you know like Carl was mentioning earlier if it was donated for after school programs and now you want to do you know feed the community those those funds were allocated for something different but this is a problem that new entrepreneurs face all the time I do a lot of work with entrepreneurs and so you have to give your organization um, some space and some grace to grow and pivot because the idea that you have when you start out generally is just an idea and then you test that idea you refine it you see where it goes and so having your purpose um, as broad as possible with under the uh, 501c3 um, parameters right is really helpful for that but then I think also just checking in having those regular meetings whether they are quarterly um, biannually or annually just to see is this what we're doing is it working for us is there something else that we should be doing another thing too is to making sure make sure you have an expert accountant working with your organization so mm -hmm. if you have 
$50,000 earmarked for project A and you want to start talking about project B, you need someone who's going to say, hey, no, you only have 20000 for B because that's all you've earned. The rest of this money has to be for something with A. So you need those, those checks and balances um, and just really staying buttoned up and put those people into place who really shine in those positions because most folks can't do all of this, right? Like I'm not going to be the one who's going to tell you how much money you have left in Project A. I'm just not, right? But I can <laughs> help think through how do we problem solve and how do we pivot the business and how do we implement the, this new plan. So it's also really important to make sure that your board is filled with different skilled people who are really good at what they do so you can bring more knowledge to the table and share in that wealth of knowledge and figure out how you're going to propel the organization forward. I completely so, agree. And I'll also just that you can, you can, you know, you can, if you plan ahead, nonprofits can avoid a lot of those limitations in terms of the way you interact with the owners. Like when you solicit money from, but you don't need to be so specific. And one thing I do is work with nonprofits and like, let's just, you know, yeah, this is restricted funds, but it's restricted funds for improving our community consistent with these values. Okay, well, that's, that could be all kinds of programs. And, you know, you're, you're not going to have someone who's like, well, does that really improve? You know, that's going to fit. So, you know, when you're just when you're messaging with donors, build build a message that's broader. I mean, I think donors donors want you to be able to do what's most effective. So I think if you're going to build that in early on, it should be it should be something you can avoid being a problem. So let me. Um, I want to add to what Miss Arlene is saying. So if the a nonprofit, and I'm speaking about a nonprofit right now that's 25 years old, if the nonprofit is looking at uh, updating their mission statement, then they should also be looking at updating their articles of incorporation. Is that what I heard you say, Asha and Carl? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think look at updating your articles. Now, there's a good chance your articles are already plenty broad and you don't need to do anything with them, but it's a good time to look at them and make sure they're not narrower than what you want to do now. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and, if, and if they are, you amend them and make them broad. And that means any new money you get, you're free to use however you want. Mm -hmm. So before we make any changes to the mission statement, look at the articles and then move forward after that. Or do we need to ha have, or do we need to bring in an attorney? I'm just you, trying to. You can look at, you can look at the, the articles are on the Secretary of State website. So you go no, to the Secretary I, of State. we have them. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. So you look at them. If they, if they are broad, if they don't have any specific purposes, go free, go ahead, do the new mission. If they're narrow, you should still go ahead and talk about the new mission, but at the same time, you know, again, ideally with an attorney, that's one, that's an attorney answering it. So of course I'm gonna say that, but two, right. it is also just like, it is easy, it, you know, it, it doesn't take a lot of time and it, it is easy to do wrong and you're gonna have to file with the secretary of state and they might reject it. So I, if possible, I would say work with an attorney to at least get a simple amendment and restatement of your articles. Um, that'd be, you know, that'd be the best way to amend it. But I wouldn't say I would stop working on your mission until that's done. That, that can get done in time. It, it, it doesn't take long and it, it, you should, you should focus. The mission stuff's more important, right? The, the legal stuff will trail and it'll get done, but the, the, the mission discussions should go forward for sure. Okay. Okay. Cause we, you know, we have a couple of attorneys on the board, but they always say the same thing. We are not nonprofit attorneys. Uh, those are the those are the experts, you know. Uh, their you know their their legal their their expertise is in something else. Mm -hmm. So, so this workshop was so helpful, and I appreciate knowing that you're going to be doing this again next month because they the attorneys on our board have said uh, nonprofit attorneys is who you all should be talking to. So you know they echoed what you said, Carl. Thank you both. I so appreciate it. We're like doctors, you know. You don't you don't want your heart yes. surgeon to be practicing on your toe or your toe <laughs> you, know, you want the expert where you need the expert that's for sure but thank you thank for that you. compliment <laughs> uh, Melissa where do we find nonprofit attorneys well you're looking at one his name is Carl Mill <laughs> I wrote it I wasn't going to answer that question but yeah yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, Carl and I both have our own practices. He actually just started his own practice a couple weeks ago. So kudos Excellent. to Carl for, for, you, for stepping Carl. out. Um, and I've had my own practice for probably longer than I care to have my own <laughs> law practice. I've had my own law practice for about 10 years now. Um, and I uh, do a little bit of nonprofit work, but mostly work with entrepreneurs um, and specifically black and brown entrepreneurs to help us create businesses build some wealth and leave a legacy. So we've got a lot of skill. We just need to learn the legal side like we're talking about here so we can mm -hmm. protect our businesses and pass them down, protect our revenue and pass 
contacts and down to other folks. Yeah, and our, our contact information is on the slides, and I can also point you to other nonprofit attorneys if you're tired of hearing me talk. That's <laughs> totally fine. I know other ones too, so it's uh, yeah. It's I took a picture talk. of the contact information on my <laughs> cell phone, so thank you. Uh, you're welcome. So uh, thank you all. We are at time. I just had a couple more things before we really, everyone hops off, but thank you, Asha. Thank you, Carl, uh, for supporting the workshop, and we will see you, of course, next month as we do in the consultant, uh, the kind of the, the drop-in one-on-one -on -one clinic um, next month. So again, thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for being on the call. Um, Davina, if you can show up on the slides real quick. Uh, and then we will, um, we, will, we will say farewell. Um, all right, yeah, yeah. So a uh, couple things. Um, one, I'm gonna plug this, the survey first. Uh, as you've been seeing it throughout the chat, please, please plug the survey. I'm gonna plug it again after I do the announcements. <laughs> but, um, uh, please, please, please uh, connect with the survey. Uh, two, uh, again, next month, we are doing the one-on-one -on -one consulting lab. Um, and so we'll have a number of different consultants on the, uh, on the, the call. Uh, we'll break you off into breakout rooms and you can ask your questions. Um, as, as you may. Uh, the last time we did this was extremely fun, um, extremely helpful, and was the highest rated workshop we've had um, in, in, in some time because folks got opportunity to connect um, on, a, on a different level. We're not gonna be talking at you. It's gonna be us in a room and you just ask us your, your, your questions. So uh, please join us uh, next month, July 22nd at 9 um, a.m. Um, and so, uh, and then we'll send out some, um, RSVP. So if you do have some some questions beforehand, um, so it'll, uh, you, you can ask those so we can kind of get, get prepared. Um, but I know a lot of them have been just random, uh, not necessarily random questions, but there are just a lot of questions that people like, this came up today, right? <laughs> so uh, we are also open and we'll do our best to address the, that uh, as they come. So um, next slide. Yeah, so answering the call, this is a workshop series through the, the San Francisco Foundation. Um, so this is also done by Carmen, Carmen Bogan. Um, so uh, the next workshop will be what your nonprofit can do to raise your community's voice. So that's happening uh, again next month, uh, July 1st, so actually next week. My, my weeks are right, because I can't, I can't recall the, the weeks anymore. Uh, uh, but next week uh, on Thursday from 12.30 to 2.00, um, you can RSVP to, to there. Um, we will send out a link um, shortly. And then lastly, but of course not least, again, I'm going to next slide. Uh, always, always, always promote the, the survey. Please provide your feedback. Let us know um, how does what today. Um, and let us know if you have any questions. Uh, uh, go to our website. Um, um, which we'll put in the chat as well. Uh, if you have, you want to see the slides again, if you need one-on-one -on -one support, we are providing one-on-one -on -one support. We are meeting with folks uh, and connecting with consultants to get help uh, that might be a little bit more uh, nuanced than some of the typical things. Uh, so again, uh, please fill out the survey, please connect with us if you have any questions. And thank you all for being on the call um, and have a great day. Thank you. Are we waiting for a survey? Um, you, if, you, if you need support with that, yes. Um, the, the survey links are in the chat. Um, so if you do need support with that, um, so we will be here. Um, um, but if I'm, you, I'm looking for it. I don't see it. I only see the um, RSVP. Uh, if you scroll down, it's, it's, oh, it's okay. there again. Yeah, there. Today's workshop. So, okay, got it. Thank you. Uh -huh. Um, and of course, you can fill out on your own time. I'm going to 
go with the honor system that you will fill it out. <laughs> <laughs> but if it helps to stay on to fill it out, you are totally welcome. We will be no there. problemo. I know it's important to receive it so you Thanks. can gauge and uh, adjust. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Hello, Miss Carla. <laughs> if she's even there. You guys have a wonderful and thank you. you bye bye. I'm here, Arlene. How are you right. doing? It was good to see you. Thanks it for is coming. so lovely to see you. familiar faces. You know, we are on this yeah. pandemic thing and it's kind of, you know, sci fi like. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Good one. laughs> I almost feel like, you know, I remember starting, I'm a Trekkie, you know, I'm a baby boomer. And, you know, you think mm -hmm. about the little the phones and all of the things that uh, were in those shows. Mm -hmm. And the Jetsons living in bubbles. And, you know. <laughs> Ooh, you're <laughs> taking me back. Ooh, oh, goodness. man. It's just like, wow, this is just a strange time. Yeah. And so just to even kind of do this connection uh, online is like really great because you can't get out in person, you know? Yes, yes. And, uh, yeah. You well, guys, it was this so is, good to see you. Yeah, this is great. This this uh, whole nonprofit thing, especially when you think about nonprofits or what kind of what's keeping the uh keeping things on an even keel it's not private industry because it's you know mm -hmm. <laughs> you're right so right yeah wow okay guys i ain't gonna hold you because i could okay. chat anyway enjoy no your day Arlene. all right all right bye 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 also we should stop the recording thank thanks evan for reminding um because i do not see it and we'll just edit out the last part, of course. Yeah, we trim the ends. We want to stop the recording now. <laughs> We're going to meet after, like right now. Briefly, because uh, I got to go back to a, another meeting. So many meetings all the time. Um, I feel like it's just, we should start a, like a like a joke blog about how many meetings. We don't have to tell any details, we, you know, because you know that can, that can get us in trouble. But we should have some jokes about like meeting virtually all day long. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think that would be a great blog or a comedy skit. <laughs>